Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers and colleagues, my name is Jean Dragon, Senior Sustainable Development Expert at the UN Office for Sustainable Development, or UNOSD, in Incheon, Republic of Korea. Welcome, and thank you all for joining this fourth and last session of the Sustainable Development Transformation Forum taking place between the 28th of February and the 3rd of, of March, 2022. The forum is organized by UNOSD, which is part of the UN DESA Division for Sustainable Development Goals in collaboration with our partners, the Asia Europe Foundation. The objective of this forum is very much related to the High Level Political Forum, or HLPF, that will take place in New York next, next July. It also aims to contribute to a better understanding of successes, challenges, lessons learned related to the implementation of SDGs 4 on quality education, 5 on gender equality, 14 on life below water, 15 life on land, and 17 on partnerships for the goal. It also aims to look at some of the impacts that the COVID-19 pandemic is having on these selected SDGs, as well as across all the SDGs in a forward-looking mode so to identify potential response and, and solutions that can also advance the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Due to COVID-19 this year again, like last year, the Sustainable Development Transformation Forum is taking place online, unlike previous years where it brought together about 100 participants from around the world over three to four days in Incheon City, South Korea, and where the these people share their knowledge and experience on sustainable development issues. We're very much looking forward to the moment we'll, we'll be able to welcome participants in Incheon City again very soon. Meanwhile, we would like to believe and we hope that the series of the, the, the series of a two and a half hour fully online sessions taking place over four days is fulfilling the objectives and goals we set for the forum. So far, from the comments we have received from you, we feel that we have succeeded to do so. First session, the three first sessions held on Monday, between Monday and uh, Wednesday, were dedicated to SDG 4 on quality education, SDG 5 on quality, um, gender equality, SDG 14 uh, on life below water in the context of building back better from the COVID-19 pandemic and fostering the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. As indicated in the program of, of the forum, in this session today, we will explore SDG 15 on life on land, and particularly how COVID-19 recovery and the 2030 Agenda can be fully uh, achieved through addressing SDG 15. Or if you allow me to reformulate those, it cannot be fully achieved without addressing SDG 15. We will hear uh, six presentations in this session. Really, uh, well, the first one is life on land, where does your food come from? Next one is uh, European, uh, European Union's SDG implementation, uh, in the European Green Deal for SDG 15. Next one, the Asia Europe Environment Forum and its involvement in the 2030 Agenda implementation. Next one is called Building Back Better with Nature Based Solution. The next, the fifth one is If the land is healthy, our food and we ourselves will be healthy. So, revival of indigenous food sovereignty. And the last one, but not the least, Africa's forest ecosystems and COVID-19. How do we build back and forward better? So uh, the session, this session will be very uh, interesting with a great panel of experts, practitioners, thinkers, and doers, all doing, working hard towards the, the achieving, achieving sustain, sustainable development goals, 15 alongside the other SDGs in their areas of expertise. 
you'll, you'll know more about the presenters through the introduction by the moderators of this session. Talking about the moderators, I'd like to introduce the two moderators uh, we'll have tonight. First, we'll have Mr. Darren Swanson, who's the UNSD consultant. And then we'll have Ms. Regina Ulaska, who is the acting director of the Sustainable Development and Public Health Department at the Asia Europe Foundation, our longtime partner in the Sustainable Development Transformation Forum. And now, unless there was last minute change in the schedule, it will be Mr. Darren Swanson who will take the floor. Darren? Thank you very much, John, and welcome colleagues uh, to this uh, fourth and final day of the uh, forum. As John mentioned, we've had a, a good previous three days of, of uh, presentations and interaction from uh, from across the, uh, the participants from around the world. And this is, in fact, what we've been doing the last several days is, is interacting. So we're going to hear from uh, some excellent presenters and uh, we of course gonna have some chance for some questions and answers uh, between each, each talk. Uh, we're gonna start the day off with a bit of uh, trivia just to warm up. We're gonna be using some, uh, some polling uh, uh, apps to, uh, to allow you to interact with uh, the forum. Um, and we're also gonna have uh, a discussion page which we've been uh, hosting here the last several days. Uh, more opportunities for participants to share, share their knowledge and experience. So just to provide a bit of backdrop on the discussion page, you will find uh, we're using the software Padlet and the barcode on the right of the screen, you could scan with your camera and it will take you to the forum poster and discussion page, or you can type in the link and the link was shared just now in the chat space. In this poster session today, we want to hear from you. If you have examples of good practice that have uh, uh, worked toward achieving and protecting life on land through policies, programs, projects, technology, uh, share those with, with all the forum participants and with us. If you have examples of implementation challenges or lessons learned, we want to hear from you and your colleagues want to hear from you. Uh, we'd also like to learn about uh, the challenges uh, that COVID has, has posed. What's, how has it impacted the work that you've been doing toward uh, protecting life on land. And finally, how can we build back better, or as the language has been used the last few days, how can we build forward better to protect life on land? So your ideas you can share on this space, and these will all make it into the forum report, and of course these pages made available for other colleagues to see. So we encourage you to actively use this space, and we will try to come back and touch on this space uh, throughout the uh, throughout the session today. And if you have any challenges getting into that site, just uh, you can share a, a chat message uh, with the forum host and they'll help you out. We're also gonna in interact through polls and some, some questions. And with that, you can use either your phone or you can have another browser open on your computer if your phone's not actually beside you. And we'll share with you a barcode in a moment here just to help you get uh, warmed up. So I guess without further ado, why don't we test? Let's test one right now. Um, and uh, see what the audience uh, knows about, uh, I guess, some of the history of the, of the sustainable development uh, goals and the 2030 agenda. So up on the screen here, we have a question and we see we already got one participant has signed in and, that, and started to answer. But the question is, this is an easy one to get you warmed up with the polling. In what year was the 2030 agenda for sustainable development adopted by the UN General Assembly? And we've got a number of options there, all, going all the way back to 1987. So you scan your phone or, or, or uh, put the, uh, the link into your browser. And of course, we've got a number of dates there. We've got 1987, going all the way back to 1987. Of course, that's an important date. That, in fact, was the publishing date of the seminal book, Our Common Future, where sustainable development concept uh, was first uh, coined and penned by the, uh, by the United Nations system. We've also got 1992 as an option there. Uh, of course, that was the date of the first Earth Summit in Rio, where the Rio, the three Rio conventions on climate change, desertification, and biodiversity were, were brought forth. 
And of course, we've got 2015, which is the answer that most people are, are suggesting. So that was the date where it all came together uh, for the sustainable development agenda, along with a number of other important resolutions and agreements that year in terms of the Paris Agreement, the financing uh, agreements, and disaster risk reduction. All right, so I think we're warmed up. We're getting a handle on the uh, on the polling function. So let's just take one more question here uh, just to get warmed up for the day, get everybody used to using the uh, interacting with the uh, with the polling. We've got a question here. This is now uh, we're looking at the the, the, the progress. The, the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals website does an excellent job of, of keeping tabs on the progress on the different sustainable development goals. So what percentage of all species globally are currently threatened with extinction? And this is now a statistic that uh, is being shared by the, uh, on, on the United Nations website. And we got a number of options there. And I see we got answers are rolling in right now. Of course, on the website, the UN uh, system does describe to us that deforestation and forest degradation and continued biodiversity loss and the ongoing degradation of ecosystems are having a profound consequences for human well-being and survival. Um, and the world fell short uh, on uh, 2020 targets to halt biodiversity loss. And the COVID-19 pandemic has, uh, has shown that by threatening biodiversity, humanity threatens its own survival. Uh, so we have a lot of good information shared on the UN website. And of course, now we've got some, uh, some statistics on the, on the polling area. We've got a number of numbers up here. We got 14% and 14% is in fact the percentage of, uh, of bird species that are threatened. And this is now all under the red list, the IUCN red list. We've got a uh, 33% is a number option there. And that is the actual percentage of reef building corals that uh, is threatened with extinction. And we have 41% is a popular answer. And that in fact is the percentage of amphibian species that are threatened uh, with extinction at the present time. Uh, the actual overall number for overall species is actually 25%. So 25% uh, of all species being monitored under the red list are in fact a, a threatened species. So we do have challenges ahead of us and a lot of work to do on biodiversity uh, loss and ecosystems. And so we're looking forward to hearing from our, present, our presenters here today. All right, thank you everyone for participating in the polls and keep that uh, poll handy. That screen will just advance automatically for you as we go through different polls uh, after uh, each of the speakers. So without further ado, Colleagues, let's uh, look our roster, our roster of speakers here today. We have a really, really uh, packed and exciting agenda today. Uh, we have a few presentations where we're going to have tandem speakers here today. Uh, and I will introduce each of our speakers as we get into uh, the, uh, the talks. And of course, our, our colleague uh, Gina Pulaska will, will take over the moderation in the second half, and you're going to hear from her in the first half here uh, when she's speaking with a colleague. Um, as we go through uh, each of the talks, I encourage you as the presenter is speaking, if you have questions you would like to pose to, your, uh, to the presenter, do share those questions in the chat space. And we'll do our best to, to address at least one question here in between uh, the sessions. Without further ado, let us move forward and introduce our first speaker for the day. We're very excited to have Mr. Pierre Boileau with us. Pierre is currently the head of the Global Environment Outlook Program at the at United Nations Environment. And in, in this role, he has uh, led his team to complete the sixth Global Environment Outlook, published in 2019, as well as six regional assessments, uh, environmental assessments, as part of that, uh, uh, the, the GEO program. Uh, prior to that, uh, Mr. Boileau was the head of the International Energy Agency's non-member country energy statistics section, where he led a team of statisticians that produced the uh, agency's global energy data publications, as well as various electronic data products. So uh, Pierre uh, knows that uh, we manage what we measure and takes that to heart. So Pierre, the floor is yours, and thank you so much for talking about us, about where does your food come from? Thanks very much, Darren and John and UNOSD for inviting me to present. Um, I'm going to try and share some slides and hopefully there aren't too many technical difficulties. 
with this. Uh, okay, um, can everybody see what I'm presenting? Um, this is the cover slide uh, for the Life on Land presentation, where does your food come from? And I asked the question, where does your food come from? Because uh, recent assessments uh, from the Worldwide Fund for Nature have identified that about 70% of biodiversity loss is coming from the global food system. And I think, Peter, I think you're going to have to uh, just uh, maybe hit the complete the hit the share button. It hasn't quite uh, appeared on our screen oh. yet. Okay. Just and just while you're doing that, I'll put the speakers just uh, just to let all the speakers know. So today we do have a packed agenda. So I'm going to disappear from the video screen while the speakers are talking. Uh, when I do appear back on the screen, when I do materialize in front of you, that it means you're at about the 12 and a half minute mark. Um, and then at about the 15 minute mark, then I'll, I'll probably make an intervention because we do want to save some time between each presentation for participants to interact with the presenters. So just to all presenters, that will be the process here today uh, that we'll follow. Uh, we can see your screen perfectly now, uh, Pierre, and over to you. Okay, thank you, Darren, for uh, uh, fixing that glitch for me. Um, I'll be drawing some of the data from this from this presentation from our recent uh, Geo6 publication, which was published in 2019. Um, but I'll also speak to some of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change findings, and some findings from a really interesting report, Building a Sustainable Food Future from the World Resources Institute. Institute. Um, first of all, I have to give a little bit of credit to all of the countries that helped us put together the uh, sixth global environment outlook. We have a number of funders, including the European Union, Norway, uh, Thailand, uh, Ministry of the Environment in China, and others who helped fund the, the project, and a number of technical institutes who provided us with a lot of support um, for the process. And of course, there were a number of governments and experts involved in the process here is a picture from the Nairobi campus um, uh, of us trying to negotiate the summary for policymakers of the Global Environment Outlook. Um, and here are some of the statistics showing how many authors were involved and how many reviewers and, uh, and uh, all of the um, uh, participants in the process. So quite a large process to give us an idea of what the state of the environment is for um, uh, life on land. And some of the findings from the geo itself are that uh, basically biodiversity is in crisis. We might actually be observing the sixth mass extinction in Earth's history at the moment. Um, this is corroborated by the uh, IPBES global assessment and a number of other uh, global assessments. On land specifically, 10 out of 14 terrestrial habitats showed a decrease in vegetation between 2000 and 2013. Um, uh, those obviously, those statistics are getting worse and worse. Deforestation rates have decreased since the 1990s from about 10 million hectares per year to about six and a half million hectares per year, but still there's quite a lot of deforestation. Uh, it's being complemented by some reforestation through planting of forests, about 3.2 million hectares per year uh, is being planted. In food production, we use about 50% of habitable land for food production. And we will need at current uh, consumption rates about 50% more food to feed the 10 billion people on the planet in 2050. Um, and uh, largely the reason that we have uh, biodiversity loss from the food system is that uh, monoculture crops have helped increase the productivity level, but have led to environmental degradation, uh, biodiversity and overall nutrition loss. So the news is not good from the, um, from the statistics that we have here. Um, I'll draw from the IPCC report that basically says that even though we are striving for 1.5 degree temperature uh, maximum in the Paris Accord, over land um, surface temperature has already increased to 1.5 degrees. On average, obviously it's still a little over one degree, um, but uh, on land we have some severe temperature increases. Desertification in 2015 um, has some pretty startling statistics. About 500 million people lived in areas experiencing desertification. Um, and we also have about a quarter of the Earth's ice-free land that is showing human-induced degradation. So soil erosion from agricultural fields um, is about 10 to 20 times uh, 
uh, higher than it would be if uh, we were on conventional tillage or from no tillage uh, practices. So again, some pretty startling statistics there. The story of life on land is really about focusing on the food system. Uh, we waste about a third of all food, 56% of it in developed countries, 44% of it in developing countries. Um, and we have a diminishing land and water resource because of climate change. Uh, land is being lost to desertification. We have more frequent droughts. Uh, we have uh, increased demand on fresh water, but lower availability of fresh water. Um, we have biofuels, biodiversity protection, and for reforestation are all competing for land uses at the moment. Um, and of course, there is a link between these human health, uh, these environmental impacts and human health impacts um, linked to the use of chemicals and fertilizers and pharmaceuticals in the food system. Um, and primarily because of uh, production of meat, which is 70%, 77% of all agricultural land use. Uh, is dedicated to meat production. On food loss and waste, um, as I said, one third or about 24% of all calories is wasted. That's about 750 billion to $1 trillion of, of food wasted each year. Um, food uh, losses and waste um, uh, are using up about 28% of the world's agricultural land area. So there is definitely a lot that we can do to reduce food loss and waste and actually contribute to a better environmental future as well as a better nutrition and food safety, a food security future. Um, if we were to look at food losses in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, it would be the third largest emitter in the world. Um, if food loss cannot be reduced, there are other uses for food waste such as compost and producing liquid fertilizers, biogas and other high end value products. Um, if this food waste was reduced, more land would be available for agricultural production um, and uh, we could use it for more environmentally friendly uh, uh, farming techniques such as organic farming or regenerative farming. Um, so let's look a little bit more closely at how we get our protein. Um, right now, about 60% of uh, global protein uh, provision to humans is provided from plant-based protein sources. Um, we're talking about sugar, wheat, lentils, beans, and other uh, types of uh, protein sources. So 40% is provided by animal protein. Uh, of course, the, the most environmentally challenging and damaging forms of animal protein are ruminant animals, uh, basically beef, goat, and sheep ruminants. Um, these are also the least efficient sources of provision of protein in terms of greenhouse gases per ton. Um, eggs, milk, poultry, pork, fish are more efficient sources of animal protein and certainly have higher, uh, lighter, pardon me, lighter garden, greenhouse gas footprints. Um, and if we all uh, adopt Western style diets and consume, we would consume about double the land and produce nearly double the greenhouse gas emissions compared to the world average. So we have to really look at this, uh, this provision of protein uh, from animal sources if we are to deal with the life on land question. Certainly uh, the trends that we observed in the, in the global environment outlook um, are that uh, we need to produce more food, which will mean that we will have more environmental impacts, while at the same time, we actually have to um, reduce the environmental impact of food production by about two thirds if we're to uh, uh, attain a sustainable, environmentally sustainable future in 2050. Um, and the way that we looked at that within the greenhouse gas, um, uh, pardon me, within, within the global environment outlook is that reducing food waste is one of the big steps that we have to take. Um, but then the other big step that we have to look take is to look at dietary changes. Really the demand side of the food system really needs to be looked at uh, really closely to be able to see if we can look at these dietary changes that would move us away from meat-based protein to plant-based protein. So my final slide is really to try and sum up. Uh, really the healthy, a healthy planet is the foundation for supporting all life forms. So life on land is essential, is essential not only to the life forms on land, but to the human life forms that also live on land. Um, 
We have transformed, however, Earth's natural systems and disrupted this self-regulatory mechanisms and the life support systems. Um, we've done that over a long period of time. We have a relatively short period of maybe 30 years to try and correct that. Uh, human health is now affected at a significant scale by harmful pollutants, pandemics, um, and uh, reduced ecosystem services. So we have a number of ecosystem services that are disappearing primarily because of biodiversity loss. However, we can actually move forward on this through policy innovations. Um, there are policies that can lead to transformational change in the food system. We can innovate and, and actually address systemic problems in the food system and uh, work towards a, a sustainable world. We really have to for, uh, focus on transformative change rather than incremental change or, or transitions um, we really need to transform what we're currently doing to move beyond this incremental improvement to achieve this uh, environmentally sustainable future. So thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Pierre, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues online, uh, chat space is available to you for questions uh, for Pierre. Uh, it was a set of startling statistics here that you brought to us here, uh, sombering to say the least, um, and well pointed out in terms of uh, of the facts. Um, because we do have a, a number of, I guess, participants from around the world here on the on the forum here today, and we'll be watching the recording afterward. Um, you had mentioned regional assessments as part of the uh, the Global Environment Outlook uh, suite of products. Uh, could you maybe share a bit more information about that for participants and 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 what they uh, what they'll find in these regional assessments and where they could go to find that? Uh, yes, of, of course, on our website um, we can provide the resources for the regional assessments and the global assessments. We did regional assessments for all six uh, UNEP regions, basically covering the entire globe. There were different priorities in each regional assessment in terms of environmental issues and, and sustainability, environmental sustainability issues. Um, Africa obviously is, is perhaps the most um, challenging area. And uh, as I was speaking mostly about food, food production in Africa is, is becoming severely impacted by climate change, by uh, droughts and, and, and water issues. Um, but we also have the same issues uh, for food production in the Middle East, for example. Uh, I don't think any region is really spared from um, the question of biodiversity loss. It is happening even in Europe and North America at significant rates. And if we are to protect life on land, as well as achieve climate change and, uh, and pollution uh, issues, we really have to start to look at the systems and the root causes of the environmental damage that we are doing. Excellent. Thanks, Pierre, for sharing that and the information available to people. Uh, there, I think the one participant was asking for the links to the geo products. I don't know if you get a chance after your, the, the question here, if you just said, could put the, the link into the chat space and uh, uh, participants will, will be uh, looking at that, I'm sure, here during the forum and, and afterward. Uh, we do have a, a one another question, a colleague, one of our uh, uh, fellow presenters, who was taking a look at the points and obviously commenting how these are uh, these amazing points uh, and startling statistics. Uh, what was mentioned was, despite the facts that uh, of being clear on the way forward with food production, um, I guess the question is, how do we convince uh, politicians and agriculture sector that reducing food waste and less meat is the is a solution, a leverage point, I guess for for transformation, um, uh, I guess looking at the uh, the unsustainable intensification, the cost of biodiversity. How do we I guess get to that? I guess information is part of that. I, I'm guessing. Well, yes, and and also action. Um, I, I would point to the fact that the Secretary General held a food system summit last September, um, which I think was a an important sign that we need to look at the food system not only from an environmental perspective, but from the fact that 800 uh, million people are not getting enough food, uh, while about almost 2.2 billion are getting too much food. So there is um, a disparity in terms of availability of food. 
There's also disparity in the nutrition that we get from food. There's a lot of stunting still going on. So there are a number of uh, sustainable development goals that are affected by the food system. So I would, I would say that we need to pull all of that information together because I think most of the messaging around food security and nutrition is also linked to changing diets um, and to eliminating the waste that we produce today. Excellent, thank you, Pierre. Um, before we go, we do have a, a poll question here coming up that we're gonna that is gonna actually bring forth, I guess, the the point, the leverage point for, for transformation that you were talking about. Um, we do have another question here that was talking about, I guess, it's about transformation. And one of the questions in the chat space uh, from a, a, uh, from a presenter from a few days ago, in fact, uh, Louis Mealman, we have uh, it's. One could argue that we need real transformation, not incremental uh, transitions, uh, and that being the theme of the forum. Um, is this conversation about food waste and its current, the current discourse for it, food waste and, and shifts in protein diet, is this just a semantic discussion or is this, is this something more fundamental that's happening right now in understanding this, this transformative uh, leverage point for, for life on land? Uh, I think, so I'll, I'll try and draw actually from a presentation here at the Environment Assembly in Nairobi that was just uh, uh, given yesterday. Akim Steiner, the former executive director, who is now the executive director of UNDP, um, gave us a statistic of uh, the fact that we currently subsidize global food systems, global food production to the tune of about $540 billion. And about 90% of that, those subsidies are nature negative. They are degrading biodiversity, degrading land. Um, and the, the transformation that we're talking about is actually shifting that funding, which um, is now producing negative environmental outcomes uh, to positive environmental outcomes, uh, storage of carbon, um, uh, protecting nature, um, diversification of crops, diversification of diets, uh, so that we actually can make this change happen. There is a lot of funding in the food system, and we can dramatically shift it if we really think about transformative ways of doing that. Excellent. Subsidy reform, yeah, I have a huge leverage point in a number of different sustainable development goals, for sure. Uh, thanks, Pierre, for that elaboration. Uh, just uh, now I want to move on, colleagues, uh, to a, a poll question that is based on Pierre's presentation. I think this uh, this question here uh, helps to, I guess, bring home some of the key points you were talking about through your presentation, uh, Pierre. Uh, so colleagues, what individual actions can you take that would have the biggest impact on preserving life on land? And we're gonna ask you just to select your top two from this list of four here, and we'll see how it starts to play out, I guess, amongst the participants. Uh, as uh, participants log in. So if you're doing on the polls, uh, everybody, you can, it should be on your screen now, um, but if not, you can just rescan the barcode or put in the link to your, uh, to your browser. Uh, we're seeing right now, Pierre, that uh, uh, colleagues are, are sort of logging in and, and taking a look at the list. Ideally, I guess we'd want to rank these, but uh, from one through four, but let's see what, what people are picking their top two and see where it uh, shakes out. I think I, I know you sort of have an idea for where the where the priorities could be, uh, just based on uh, I guess uh, root causes of issues. But perhaps Pierre, do you want to comment a bit on what you're seeing and what you think the ranking should be, or where are those really most important actions that we could be taking? Uh, yeah, it's very encouraging to to see people. I think understanding the core of the message from the presentation. Uh, I would say that um, it, it is a bit, a bit of a mix of the top three there. Reduce the amount of food you waste obviously is, is a critical part. Uh, there are elements of the food weight loss and waste question that are not necessarily consumer based. Um, a lot of the food in Africa is lost at the production stage because there is no viable cold chain or there are the, the grain degrades over time in storage. So there are elements of the of the food loss and waste question that actually are upstream, but it's also very, very important to not 
waste the food that you consume personally. Uh, shifting to plant-based protein diets is clearly a way of changing the demand equation in the food system so that we create actually demand for crops that provide us protein in forms uh, that um, we can eat directly rather than feeding them to, uh, to animals, to domesticated animals. So I think that we are in a very good shape there of the understanding of what uh, consumers can do. These actions, it, you know, they may seem very small on an individual basis, but in fact, um, consumers have enormous power to shift these markets. And I think that uh, if, if you individually make the choice to perhaps shift to a slightly more plant-based protein diet, obviously to reduce the food waste that you, that you do produce, um, and even if you can't shift to a plant-based protein diet, try shifting to a less a, a diet that's less based on ruminant meats, um, consume more chicken and pork and less beef and, and lamb. So I think the message has gotten across. I'm really pleased about that. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pierre. On behalf of everybody, thank you for sharing uh, the, the numbers with us uh, because they do drive action and inform action. So thank you very much. Colleagues, we are going to move on now to our next uh, presentation. And we are very pleased to have with us uh, uh, two colleagues uh, that are going to uh, share this presentation. We have uh, Ms. Ingeborg Nistroy. Welcome, Inge. Uh, she is the Director of Public Strategy for Sustainable Development uh, uh, Consulting, uh, and where she focuses on governance questions for sustainable development. And that really leverages her PhD background where she worked on strategic environmental assessment. Um, formerly, Ingi was the Secretary General for the European Network uh, of Advisory Councils for Environmental Policy and Sustainable Development. And Ingi will be presenting today with uh, Mr. Raphael Weyland. And Raphael is the Head of Office for the German Nature Conservation Union. Uh, before that, he worked as an environmental lawyer in Hamburg, where he represented clients fighting against, for instance, uh, deepening of rivers, building of uh, coal power plants, and Mr. Whalen's uh, academic work, PhD work, focused on climate policy and uh, sustainability issues. Ingi, you and Whalen are going to uh, uh, take walk us through uh, a number of areas in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the European context, the EU context. So, welcome, Ingi. The floor is yours. I'm trying to share now. All right, I'm uh, just stopping my share and. Uh, okay, should work. Should start, should start to work for you. I'm going to disappear from the screen, Ingi, and then the you are sharing. Uh, okay, now you should hopefully the next step also works. Yes, now you share. Screen. You see the full screen. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. So I don't see anybody but Darren, and then after Darren, nobody more. Raphael maybe comes on the picture, then uh, I don't feel so alone. Um, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure um, to be at the SDTF. I wasn't able to pull out an iconic picture. Um, it will always stay in my heart because I celebrated my 50th birthday there during an SDTF uh, some years ago. So. Um, I, I, I skipped how many years exactly that is ago. Um, so, as Darren said, we will move a bit into the uh, EU uh, story and uh, together with uh, Raphael, I will cover the two introductory points on uh, the, the fundamental question. I wanted to uh, tackle again uh, the introduction to the EU policies and then the number three, Raphael. Uh, will do, and we really try to stay in time. So the first question, what makes SDG 15 so fundamental, the question of this session? The answer comes, of course, from uh, as uh, Pierre presented, and it is uh, all over the place from the threatened species, the planetary boundaries, boundaries, but it can also come from the systemic perspective, or with that, it also comes from the pers uh, systemic perspective, which again is enshrined in this principle of uh, Agenda 2030 of um, indivisibility of the um, SDGs. So while it is clear you need to concentrate on the individual SDGs, you always also need to think um, them as a, uh, as a system and uh, together. So I want to remind with my little contribution, I want to remind to that. 
So this is how this then all started. Then everything is connected to everything. This is how it looked in the very beginning. Oh God, when the SDGs were out and oh God on 17, oh God, this is so complex. And the pictures looked like this and uh, so on and all these interlinkages and inter interactions. But then when you have a second look, the thing becomes a, a, a system. And um, this is the key system I, I want to share with you today for which uh, it really makes it understandable and uh, it really shows um, how fundamental uh, SDG 15 is. You see, it is here in this pyramid in the very bottom. So this pyramid is uh, the ultimate, the means ends logic of Herman Daly, the ecological economist from the 70s. So which says then you have the ultimate means and ultimate ends. The means is the basic and the ends is the goal, ultimate goal. You can also say, and then two intermediate steps. So the ultimate means means it is really the basics and uh, translated then in the right column here uh, uh, in this uh, in the capital language is then the basics is the natural capital solar energy biosphere earth material the biochemical cycles the next level the intermediate means is then how to how these things are processed so providing water for use providing um, um, products, plants for food, as we just had, providing solar energy in other energy forms, and the whole story of uh, consumption and production circular economy, and then moving up is the ultimate ends. That is kind of everything human and social related uh, around uh, health, education, uh, knowledge, uh, and so forth, and. Uh, the ultimate ends is uh, well-being and um, happiness, harmony. And as here you can already see, it's not only human and but also planetary well-being. That leads to a graph we uh, developed together um, after consultation in Asia, by the way. Everybody said, oh, no, this is much too linear. So we tried here to illustrate uh, in the project uh, together with Laszlo and Gina, by the way, um, uh, an ASEF uh, project uh, turned this into a, a circle. Yeah, because human um, well-being is eventually also based on uh, this planetary uh, well-being, and there we are back to the ultimate means. So that's the story of why SDG 15 is so important. This is a graph, the wedding cake, SDG wedding cake, you all will have seen, I guess, uh, which looks as if it is this pyramid, but it is not. What it is common is that the biosphere is the basic, so this same idea, but then the logic in the upper parts is different, so don't use that, but use this one. This is definitely turning this um, wedding cake idea, the pyramid, with together with this daily uh, logic of the pyramid and you see here again natural resource base is the basics well-being is here on top human and uh, 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 social and then in the middle you have this transition ring of providing natural products uh, turning the natural base into products that will be used by humans voila so that was my little uh, introduction to the sd uh, G's why this SDG 15 and now to the EU, um, then uh, this leads obviously uh, directly to the question of universality. Uh, each country we have here the uh, human development index and the ecological footprint, you know, this graph maybe and then here the developed countries are here in the right upper part and for them the goal is you have to bring your ecological footprint down. And this then made uh, our then uh, vice uh, commission vice president in 2015 when the SDGs were uh, adopted to say my main message, uh, Europe's message is it is also our turn. So he referred to every to this universality to step out of our comfort town zone. We have to turn around our economies to make them circular, leaving behind our take, make, consume and dispose 
growth pattern. So that was 2015. Unfortunately, not too much happened then in the years thereafter. It was also a bit, oh, everything a bit slow burning uh, because he was only uh, vice president uh, in a not so strong uh, position as he then became later, namely in 2019 with a new commission, which really made, you see this in the in the bottom, um, or in the three points actually, which made the SDGs and the sustainability agenda a big, big uh, mainstreaming uh, effort. Uh, you see it here that the, the upper part, the European semester, that is a tool to coordinate economic policies between the EU and the member states. There the SDGs were put in. Then each commissioner did get a mission letter. So from the boss boss, uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, so the commission's president, to make sure that the SDGs are integrated. This has been so, so followed up. And then the big shot was uh, number three here, the, uh, that refers still to the top. The semester was then also linked to the recovery plan. So the post COVID story, which is also here in our uh, session. And then, okay, sorry. And then at the bottom, the European Green Deal is at the heart of this program of this, uh, this current European Commission and is the highest priority. And that comes then with um, a big policy package, or it is a big policy package um, in, in the whole spectrum of uh, things concerned here at the bottom, at the natural base, biodiversity strategy, and the whole processing ring, as we said, providing food, providing water, uh, pro providing energy. And with that, I'm handing over to my colleague, uh, Rafael, who will tell you um, details uh, about it. Rafael, you tell me how I um, push forward the slides. Fine, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks also. Um, I mean, also on my side, I feel uh, honored to, to, to bring in the conservationist uh, point of view on uh, this, by the way, um, World Species Protection Day today. Um, so let's uh, move on and, and go more into details. Um, we can go quite quickly through the next two slides. Um, I mean, we heard already from Pierre why um, biodiversity matters. You all should know because you are here in this uh, uh, forum. Um, these are the so-called uh, ecos I mean, sometimes called uh, ecosystem services, uh, food security, clean water, uh, flood retention, uh, carbon storage. But uh, even more, I mean, uh, I'm al always stressing that we need to protect biodiversity also intrinsically. Um, but they had also a huge, um, and they have an impact for for, for pandemics uh, and also for medical um, uh, supply of resources. And this is why we, of course, need to implement uh, the, or achieve the, the SDG 15 and, and push forward here. Um, so where do we stand? Also there, we heard already that the state is not as good as we are always hoping. Um, the biodiversity is in, in, in a crisis. The crisis is as existential as the climate crisis. Um, we know a lot already, um, the drivers we know, um, I took the graph on the left from the IPBES report, which came out in, uh, in, in 2019, which shows um, the, the drivers for, I mean, for SDG 15, it's mostly terrestrial and freshwater. So there we have um, uh, the, the drivers land and sea use change, which is uh, mostly linked to um, uh, intensification of agriculture, to road construction. The second biggest, uh, second biggest driver is, is, is uh, direct exploitation, which is um, I mean, mineral extraction or fishing or so. So we know a lot, um, yet uh, we don't act as needed. Um, I have often the feeling that the biodiversity crisis is even not as much covered as the climate crisis, where we all know that already actions with climate crisis are not sufficient. So. Um, it is very good that you talk about it and uh, that we try to, to move this, this forward. The next slide. Um, when I started 2015 to work in Brussels, I mean, let's say as lobbyist for nature, I mean, it's an NGO NABU and I'm working as lobbyist. Um, I was very much uh, putting my efforts in defending what we had. Um, at that time, the, uh, the, the, the mood uh, of the member states and the commission was to even 
weaken existing laws. And when um, Commission President von der Leyen was elected, we, all the NGO side, all the stakeholders were asking, of course, is there a wind of change coming? I will answer the question later on. But um, now let's see what uh, the uh, von der Leyen Commission brought. You saw the you saw the, the this wheel from from uh, from Inge already, and I mean I, I put it here again because indeed on the right side all these um, actions that are announced relate to implementing um, the SDG 15. Um, with the CIP, um, which uh, I mean it's, it's it's standing for Common Agricultural Policy. Um, there is rather business as, as usual. The, uh, the, the CIP was uh, already um, prepared by the, the previous commission um, or Commissioner Hogan at that time, and von der Leyen did not change it too much, also because there is a huge, a huge pressure from member states. So we still have a two-pillar system where the first pillar is direct payments, so flat-based uh, area payments. And they are they can be considered from the biodiversity point of view as harmful subsidies, but I mean at least um, the commission tried to bring in a bit of new focus uh, with the so-called uh, farm to fork strategy, um, which tries to um, break up a bit the the, the, the former um, dogma and and might change for the future. So that's that's the agricultural side. Then in May to, uh, 2020, the Commission presented the new biodiversity strategy, which is running up to 2030. Also, there the pandemic was, uh, I mean, it was it was 2020 um, was delaying a lot the outcome. It was already foreseen for for much earlier. Just as by the way, the, the I mean, of course, the, the we know the for nature agreement in Kunming, was, which was postponed several times. Um, but. Uh, and there was a lot of pressure from industry to um, not focus in, in general on green deal topics at, 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 in, in 2020. But still the commission kept track and presented the strategy. And I mean, NGOs were very happy. It has good elements, even legislative elements, which I will show on the next slide later. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of, um, of, of, of uh, further, um, further elements um, in, the, in EU policies, which are ensuring the protection of nature and implementation of SDG 15, just to name the nature directive. So the birds and the habitats directive, which are the cornerstone of, 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 of or the backbone of, 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 of environmental law in, in that field. And then there's small things like um, the ban of lead shot in the wetlands, which we had last year. And we are, I mean, the EU is, is, is proposing to ban lead shot as such um, in the EU. In ammunition, um, then um, we have a biodiversity expenditure target in the EU budget, the MFF, um, and also what Inge mentioned already that uh, there is uh, there is um, there is a recovery um, fund, the RRF, um, where biodiversity at least is mentioned. Next slide quickly. Um, so some game changers from the concrete uh, biodiversity strategy. Um, there is a pillar. Um, the biodiversity strategy as such has 40 measures, um, but some pillars can be seen as game changers. From my point of view, we have this pillar of protected areas, um, which is not legally binding, but where member states have to contribute to uh, at least uh, ensure a protection of 30% of EU land and sea, 10% out of it strictly. Um, one element of this pr uh, protected area, of course, is uh, Natura 2000, which just partied the 30th anniversary. Um, then we have addressing the drivers in the strategy, which is going in this CIP, which is the dinosaur, and uh, through bringing in uh, landscape features, pesticides reduction, where we'll see uh, where we will see a legislative proposal the 23 of March, and organic agriculture targets, we can break up a bit this 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 old uh, policy. And then um, also one huge field where we, have, we put a lot of, of expectations in is, is, is proper dedicated nature restoration legislation, which will be presented 23 of March too. So that will focus on peatland and, and such ecosystems. Um, so to say the biodiversity strategy, next point, um, there's a lot of in, um, of course, it all depends later on the implementation. So is the Green Deal a, a real deal? Um, we can say the Green Deal is much more uh, than just a narrative. We are very happy that 
and we of course have to to further push uh, especially for implementation but it is a very good prioritization of von der Leyen. there are limitations like the cip um, the biggest lim uh, limitation though is the lacking support of, of of member states and which at the end need need to implement of course and um i mean to 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 refer to the ipcc report which came out uh, 3 days or 2 days ago um we more and more see that healthy ecosystems are also important to tackle the climate crisis. Um, the co-chair Hans Otto Pörtner uh, said, by restoring degraded ecosystems and effectively conserving uh, 30 to 50% of Earth's land, freshwater and uh, ocean habitats, um, society can benefit from nature's capacity to absorb and store carbon. And we can accelerate progress towards sustainable development. So really protecting nature is also um, uh, benefiting climate protection. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, both Ingi and Raphael. I want to, uh, I want to, I'm gonna share my screen back and we are gonna move right to a poll question here that's really just rooted in your, uh, in your presentation. Um, we can see, okay, I think we're back on. Ingi, thank you for setting the stage. I, I like the way you, you sort of introduced the complexity of the sustainable development agenda and, and bringing in the wedding cake. Talking about the wedding cake diagram helps to kind of everyone to see how the life on land is really foundational to, uh, uh, to sustainable development. So thanks for setting that up and then uh, Raphael for bringing us to the details. We're posing a question here to participants. I'm hoping that Ingi, you and Raphael can provide a bit of narration here as, as participants see this on the screen. Uh, so colleagues uh, online, uh, Rafael and Ingi are posing a question of which do you think are, are, are the reasons that would explain why biodiversity has not been better addressed in the EU? And there's three three elements there that are, are, are no possible explanations. Uh, which of those do you think are, are, are maybe re, uh, explaining what's going on? So Ingi, Rafael, can you set us up with with the options that are here and maybe a bit of narration of what you're seeing from participants. Um, I, I can go in uh, if, if in is fine. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to see that the, that, that the preferences amongst the participants are, are still changing because indeed um, all three um, causes are, are, are valid. I mean, uh, we have, in the EU, this, I mean, which I mentioned, the incoherent policies from the past, the, the uh, agricultural policy was built after Second World War to have uh, food security, and now the challenges are much different, but the, the, the policy did never really change. It's, it's still this two-pillar policy. Um, but of course, um, we have insufficient funding. When we look at the, um, at the multi-annual financial framework, there is still no dedicated uh, fund for nature. I mean, when we look the, the I mean, uh, the, in, 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 the, in the context of the, 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 the next CBD, the, the, the Kunming agreement, um, we would worldwide just ask for as much money for nature as the CIP has, but we don't get that. And then, of course, um, we have good uh, existing legislation like the, 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 the birds and the habitats directive, which is providing a network of protected areas. But we have to, 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 to admit that on paper, the, 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 the sites exist, but they are not implemented. There are no specific conservation measures. So even there is a lot of work to do. Uh, excellent. So we're seeing that, in fact, as Inge, you're probably going to point out that the, uh, the answer is uh, really all of these are playing a role. And that probably speaks to you know, broader governance types issues. Inge. I have the million dollar question, <laughs> Rafael. Why is it so difficult to improve and change uh, the common agriculture policy? There is no superpower. What are these big interests? What are what is the power? What's the political economy? As it's so said, there is no superpower like oil exporting countries, like the nuclear lobby. What? Why is that? Even with such a dedicated commission, uh, such a doesn't such a problem. I mean, that's indeed the, the, the question where I just can give in some. That's a, that, that's a big question, Raphael, but of course, you're going to have just a very short amount of time to answer yeah. it. So <laughs> I mean, it's, 
it's of course the strength of, I mean, let's say the agricultural stakeholders, which are, I mean, not representing all farmers, but uh, mostly a certain group of farmers, the big ones that profit more from the, from the area-based payments. But then it's also the structure of the EU where changing a policy is more difficult than, than creating it. And um, I mean, it's about a lot of money and member state. I mean, it was uh, Germany, France, uh, they receive money back, which they, they don't, I mean, they have elections. The, 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 the commission is, is not as strong as we believe because the European Union has no proper government, but is depending in the council on the member states. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Okay, thanks. At sure. least some hints. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Ingi and, and Raphael, for walking us through through that. And uh, please do keep an eye on the chat space, too. If there's uh, if information you want to provide, uh, you can post it on the Padlet page or uh, uh, provide links here in the chat space. Uh, I, there are some questions, I think, that are getting uh, some more general questions, and I'm going to address those when we come back to the Padlet page. I'm seeing in the chat space where we're going to look for some maybe some examples from colleagues across the forum. Uh, but thank you, Ingi and Raphael. All right, colleagues, we are going to move on to our uh, uh, last presentation of this uh, first first half of the forum here. And uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Gina Pulaska. She is the Acting Director of Sustainable Development and Public Health Department at the Asia Europe Foundation. And prior to working at the Asia Europe Foundation, Gina worked with the Ministry of Economy in Poland and was also active in the NGO sector mainly uh, with the uh, Service uh, Civil International Network in Belgium and uh, the Bangladesh-based uh, Development Wheel NGO specializing in supporting local entrepreneurship and fair trade. And Gina will be presenting with uh, Ms. Rico Komoto. Uh, she is manager of the International Public Health Sustainable Development and Public Health Department at the Asia Europe Foundation. And prior to that, Rico was uh, an NGO volunteer in Latin America collaborating with uh, local and international agencies, such as the Ministry of Health and also the, the UNHCR. Uh, she has worked in Africa as a project supervisor for hospital management, and she is, in fact, has a Bachelor of Nursing degree and a Master's degree in international public health. So welcome both Gina and Rico, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Darren, for this wonderful introduction. And I would like to request UNOS, the Office for the Assistance, with sharing the slides. I just would like to welcome everybody and also thank the previous speakers, uh, especially when we had the Global Environmental Outlook introduction that was looking into, among other things, food-related production. And also the, um, the further, uh, further presentation from Ingeborg Nestroy that we had an enormous pleasure in the past to work on sustainable development goals before the 2030 agenda was even implemented. And she was slightly referring to our work about this in the past. Next slide, please. So I just want to a little bit set up the stage for the presentation that we'll be looking into um, agricultural related issues uh, in connection to life on land. I think we had already so far a very good linkage just showing how much land use and deforestations are connected to agriculture and food production. So we would like to come with some solutions. I have seen a bit of questions before on the, uh, on the chat related with the fact, okay, so what fact, what actually we can do with regards to existing situation. So we do hope to provide a bit of solution that is based on our uh, process that we are running under the umbrella of Asia Europe Environment Forum. That is a partnership of organizations from Asia and Europe that are working on sustainable development and specifically on the SDG 12 and SDG 13 in correlation and exploring interlinkages to other SDGs. Can I have next slide? In general, in our work, we always try to provide the context which is related to research. In, uh, in principle, we support knowledge exchange and also capacity building. So having those principles in mind, we would like to invite you to uh, get engaged with us a little bit more. And this is also one of the avenues that we are, um, we are using, which is collaboration with UNOSD on this Sustainable Development uh, Forum. Next one, please. 
And without really taking more time from the spotlight that is rela uh, related to the SDG 15, but also the uh, work we have done on the future of food, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Riko Kimoto from Asia Europe Foundation, and she will guide you through the, one of the policy briefs, findings, the solutions that we have discussed at the conference that took place in uh, no, December last year that was under the umbrella of future of food and exploring how we can actually address the pressing issues um, that are here now and we are all facing them, especially in the correlation to COVID. Thank you very much, Gina, for the introduction. I am going to talk about regenerative agriculture in relation to SDG 15, life on land. Globally, agriculture is estimated to be the driver for about 80% of land degradation. Moreover, agriculture... Ah, next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> next. Moreover, agriculture both contributes to and is affected by climate change. Therefore, under the umbrella of Asia Europe Foundation's thematic areas of sustainable development and public health, we conduced a session that focused on food production and agriculture in particular. Climate change is a result of a linear economy, make, take, and waste. 45% of greenhouse gas emissions are product-based, which include food and agriculture. According to the UN report, approximately 90% of the 540 billion in global subsidies given to farmers every year are harmful, supporting agricultural practice that negatively affect people's health, fuel the climate crisis, destroy nature and drive inequality by excluding smallholder farmers and many of whom are women. Agriculture, practices, it, agriculture practice is responsible for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions, 70% of biodiversity loss, and 80% of deforestation. Given these overwhelming statistics, what can we do to protect, restore, and promote sustainable terrestrial ecosystem, sustainably manage forest, combat the this disertification, and halt and reserve land degradation and halt biodiversity loss? Next slide, please. To tackle the issue, the session introduced regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture offers a holistic approach to land management practice that leverages the power of photosynthesis in plants to close the carbon cycle and build soil health, crop resilience, and nutrient density. Specific principles include no till or minimum tillage, soil fertility increased through biological means, build biological ecosystem diversity, increase well-managed grazing practice. Next, please. Uh, differences between the conventional farming practice versus regenerative uh, farming practice are shown here. Our session also included the element of antimicrobial resistance, AMR, which is often referred to as climate change of health. AMR doesn't only affect human health, but also animal health and the environment. So we encourage to consider aspects related to AMR when shifting to regenerative agriculture. As part of the effort shifting to regenerative farming practice, addressing AMR at the same time will contribute to society significantly as there are some commonalities under the One Health approach. 
we only have one land and damage requires many decades to recover. It can take up to 1,000 years to produce one centimeter of fertile soil, but only a couple of years to lose it. We need to act to preserve and restore our soils. Next slide, please. During the session, we also touched upon agroecology. Agroecology is a holistic and integrated approach that simultaneously applies ecological and social concepts and principles to design and management of sustainable agriculture and food systems. Both regenerative agriculture and agroecology mainstream biological diversity, protect and restore critical ecosystem services, and harness the full potential of natural process. Both improve soil health, then it increases soil organic matter, then contribute to life of land. Next slide, please. Now I would like to share some of the solutions that were highlighted during the session. Adjusting subsidies to agriculture should be based on net contributions to climate change and provision of ecosystem service services and gathering more evidence on the performance of alternative food production system. It is, it is also important more institutes to have more institutional support towards regenerative agriculture and agroecology. Find ways to convey the evidence in a form that is useful to drive and support policy making. And also we need to overcome disciplinary and sectoral divisions in research and policy making. Next slide, please. All, as all SDGs are interconnected, we cannot ignore any elements of the 17 goals. Especially 15, life on land has a direct impact on other SDGs, as I presented a few aspects from food, climate change, and health. COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated that the pandemic is not an issue the health sector alone can resolve. It demonstrated the impact of public health emergencies on our society and our life beyond the health sector. Therefore, COVID-19 recovery requires a truly multi-sectoral multi approach, and SDG 15 is fundamental, as we only have one planet and one land. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Gina and Rico. You walked us through uh, a number of areas and, and thank you for talking about, again, bringing us to the topic of subsidies you touched on and also, uh, I think, bringing us to this idea of the uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and also uh, agroecology, um, bringing some some big transformative solutions to the table right right off right off the bat and um so i just want to uh i guess bring focus the discussion on on a key aspect of your of your presentation so i don't know if uh, if, if gina is also there with you um but we can have the discussion here with the three of us um i think a the question, I guess, that, that we could pose that sort of provides a backdrop to your presentation is to participants, which is the main driver for deforestation? And we have a number of solutions or uh, options that are on the screen here. Uh, so for Rika, Rico and, and, and uh, Gina, what, can you perhaps elaborate a bit on, I guess, the, the, the aspect of the, the agroecology, regenerative, agric uh, regenerative agriculture, um, the, and sort of how is that really, how are those, how are those solutions then going to really hit this leverage point? So I think you've, you've highlighted the deforestation and participants are starting to, to kind of clue in on maybe what the possible answer is. So maybe share the possible answer to this question and then maybe elaborate a bit more on those solutions you just talked about. Uh, 
we are looking at each other, wondering what would be the best way to start. In general, I think the idea behind this agroecology is strongly related with, um, with the holistic approach that is looking at the, all the practices we are doing uh, regarding um, animal production and plant production with the agriculture. So when you are looking with the respect at what is happening regarding the farming, and if you are looking at the biodiversity and the system as a whole, this really helps you to design and manage the food system in a way that you are not harming or impacting biodiversity related issues. So I think in general, this really helps in the sense that when we look at food production and especially agriculture, it is both contributing to climate change and being affected by climate change. So when we are able to reduce the impact and the GHG gas emissions, by changing the way we are farming and changing the way we are producing food, this will immediately help with uh, mitigating. And then it will also help if we, when we farm, we farm also with the plan in mind, because like obviously we, there is this issues of food security, especially during COVID-19. This, this has been also the issue that was very, clearly shaping the agenda for uh, food production that was happening. And then when we look at this and the deforestation that is connected with the fact that our farming practices are not as efficient because they are not circular, and then they are affecting the forest, which uh, then we cannot really uh, help with the CO2 emissions that are coming from farming. This is not really helping. And I just was, I cannot resist referring to the previous question that Inga had to her former speaker, which is when we are thinking, for example, what is happening in the European Union and farm to fork strategy and European Green New Deal. And then we are thinking, okay, what is so difficult about having the subsidies, but distributed smarter for circular practices, for enabling and empowering, em empowering food producers and farmers to actually shift to sustainable food production, food production and agricultural practices that will help us all. Um, I always think that um, sometimes um, some things uh, require systemic change, but I also think it, they require advocacy and also they require um, changing of the lifestyle and a little bit more um, energy from all of us to actually push the needle a little bit in a different direction to, to close this, to close the loop and uh, really, really go away far from the linear production and move towards circularity. Thank you. That was, I think that was nice to, uh, it comes back to, I guess, the context that Pierre provided in his first presentation about how we need more food going forward, but we have less land, less available land and more pressured land resources. So the circular economy idea that you guys brought forth and regenerative agriculture, agroecology, uh, really just helps to, to handle that. And thanks for bringing it down to the ground where uh, these these transformative sort of actions do sort of come down to the ground level to the individual person as well. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. So we do have agriculture being a, a driver of deforestation as the poll is, as, as participants were were, were uh, uh, understanding. Um, but the, this idea of needing more food, but needing to do uh, more food more efficiently uh, with the resources. Um, so thank you very much uh, on behalf of everybody, Gina and, and Rico, and I hope you can uh, monitor the chat space if there's questions that are that are appearing. Um, I do want to just before we move on here to the second half, I do want to go to the uh, just to touch very briefly on the Padlet page. And just to refresh and uh, as you can see on the screen, we've got some good activity on the Padlet page. And I just want to encourage uh, participants and speakers to uh, continue to provide information here. And I want to thank, uh, I think we've got uh, information here on education for sustainable development and good practices. I want to, and circular food systems. We've got examples from participants. So this is fantastic. 
Um, thank you for adding that information. We've got uh, information, I think Pierre posted the GEO6 report here um, and highlighting some of the challenges and we've got good examples from COVID. And I wanna thank too, we've got participants here that are, are highlighting particular challenges and issues uh, uh, from uh, indigenous people's perspectives. And thank you for uh, speakers for providing some, uh, some re uh, responses to those. So this page, everyone, is a chance for participants to, uh, to, to share their knowledge, experiences, challenges, and other participants and speakers can, uh, can reply and comment to these, uh, to, to, to these uh, postings to keep the conversation going and alive during and after the event. So I wanna thank you very much, everybody, for rolling up your sleeves to interact in this uh, virtual world that we do have. Um, with that, I would like to return to our uh, agenda and uh, we will go straight uh, to our next presentation. And Gina uh, will now take over to moderate the sessions. And let me get all set up here, Gina. All right, back over to you. Uh, Gina, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Darren. Thank you so much, Darren. I have today a double role in uh, bridging two sessions together. Uh, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Laszlo Pinter. He is professor and head of the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at the Central European University and private university in Austria. Laszlo is also a senior fellow at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, where he formerly was director of the measurement and assessment program. And I just would like to add from our side that Laszlo has been since many years a member of the steering committee of the Asia Europe Environment Forum, and we have been very much looking forward to his presentation and also future work with Asia Europe Foundation that will be happening soon, build back together with nature-based solution. Uh, so we would like, so I would like to encourage you to listen carefully to his presentation also because some of the questions that have been already in the chat about what one can do on the ground um, in the province when the uh, when the climate change effects are impacting the local community, one of the solutions that are existing already are nature-based and there it is something that can be um, ap applied and uh, learned from. Laszlo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Gina. Uh, and uh, just can you give me a, you are done a time check um, to make sure I'm not pushing the boundaries? Yes. 10 minutes? Yes, 10 minutes is good. Um, and then I, I will switch on my video when we are approaching danger zone. Yes, very good. Uh, and can you, uh, can the secretary share my screen or should I share my slides from my laptop? You can proceed to share from your laptop, Laszlo, if you can. Uh, Get the sharing going, but if that doesn't work, then uh, uh, UNOSD can share for you. I can't. I can't do that. Just one second. So you just have to give me a signal if if it works at your end. All is good. We can see your screen very well. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to speak uh, from the perspective uh, of. Uh, uh, not of nature-based solutions, uh, but focusing uh, actually on cities. Of course, uh, as it already came out in in, uh, in some of the previous sessions, um, in order to address uh, SDG 15, we have to go where the real uh, problem is. And in one sense, that's of course in, in natural ecosystems. Um, uh, but at the same time, we also have to uh, think about uh, impacts on people. And of course, uh, people tend to congregate in cities. Uh, in fact, more and more people uh, live in cities and uh, in cities uh, uh, in and of themselves became uh, problematic in the sense that uh, they are um, lacking uh, nature uh, and natural ecosystems and uh, they um, 
uh, and particularly during the, uh, the pandemic, it became clear that lack of access to nature uh, had very far reaching uh, consequences uh, for human health and well being. So I'm going to be speaking from the perspective uh, of not just SDG 15, but, uh, but particularly what nature and nature based solutions in particular uh, can, uh, can do uh, along these lines. I'm, I'll be speaking uh, from the perspective of a, a major uh, four and a half year uh, project supported by uh, the EU's Horizon 2020 program that we just finished last uh, year. Uh, so I'll provide a link uh, later on. Um, now, for, uh, again, to go back to the basic uh, uh, idea in, in SDG 15, uh, it's focusing on, uh, on protecting, restoring, promoting the sustainable use of um, ecosystems, terrestrial ecosystems, uh, forest desertification, reversing land degradation or halting biodiversity loss. Of course, some of these, you know, you can convert some of these ideas already into, into the urban context. Uh, so as, as I mentioned, particularly in the sense that, uh, that cities tend to be, uh, can be uh, devoid of natural ecosystems, um, uh, forest cover uh, and biodiversity in general. So that is a problem, but it's also uh, uh, an important uh, opportunity. And uh, uh, just to illustrate that uh, we need new visions of, uh, of cities, not just as the places uh, that are all the sources of problems for nature, but also how can they contribute to solutions? Of course, uh, this is not just about um, uh, not just about the actual, let's say, volume of, of green space, the actual uh, species and biodiversity that can uh, be re-injected uh, into, uh, into cities and communities. It's also about transforming mindsets uh, in the people uh, and children, particularly who, who, who experience, who live with, who experience nature in cities, in where they tend to live, again, mostly, uh, they will have different ideas about the value of uh, of uh, of ecosystems uh, in also in the broader context. So I think we uh, so this is not just about the the material direct value of nature, but uh, but also uh, the uh, its power uh, to change mindsets in the broader and more uh, more holistic sense. So I've I've been using the, the concept of nature based solutions, which is um, in some sense. Uh, uh, new new wine uh, in an old uh, old bottle. Uh, some of the components of, of uh, covered by nature based solutions are actually not uh, uh, not new. Uh, urban parks, um, urban gardens are, are examples, but there are also uh, also many uh, uh, nature based solutions that uh, that uh, became uh, more uh, popular and interesting recently. Uh, such as uh, the uh, the more extensive use of uh, of uh, green walls, uh, green roofs, even internal green areas, uh, permeable water surfaces, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, uh, there are practices that have been with us for some time. There are practices that are emerging. The main point in uh, in nature based solutions is uh, uh, is that uh, is the emphasis on their purposeful use to address, uh, in this case, urban sustainability challenges. So they shouldn't be just happening uh, by accident, which is uh, the general conclusion of this, uh, of this literature, um, uh, but, uh, but they should be consciously planned into uh, and, and, uh, and made use in, uh, made, made use, uh, used in, uh, in, uh, in the urban context to, uh, to maximize their benefits. So we tend to speak from this perspective about uh, the unrealized uh, potential of uh, of nature-based solutions, unrealized potential of urban nature, and uh, the uh, the classification uh, that you see on screen here is uh, is a standard classification uh, that arose from a series of um, of major uh, projects in the Horizon program and uh, and before. So, for the purposes of our work, we also uh, uh, adopted this. So, um, so why? Our nature-based solutions uh, uh, interesting and, and relevant for uh, for uh, for uh, SDG 15 because they contribute uh, on, a, on a number of uh, different fronts. So some of these are actually go beyond SDG 15. Um, 
uh, green space, uh, habitat, provision of habitat, provi uh, provision of biodiversity, of course, that's quite, quite central uh, to SDG 15. Um, climate adaptation and mitigation is, of course, closely related because of the cl of climate uh, damage, climate change uh, uh, damage to, uh, to natural ecosystems. Uh, in this, and in this case, particularly also to cities, uh, they can contribute to economic development. Uh, it can improve environmental quality, whether water quality, air quality, can contribute to soil carbon, contribute to water management by retaining water, 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 uh, water purification, <coughs> contribute uh, to, uh, to physical and mental health, um, can address social justice and cohesion issues like providing access to green space, not only to the uh, to do well to do, but also the poor and the disadvantaged. Uh, and they can contribute to in improve governance uh, by bringing attention to what actually uh, makes uh, green space management or nature based solutions management uh, workable and uh, and effective. So if uh, one tries to uh, look at uh, the SDG 15 uh, in, in particular, uh, then um, I just circled some of the, uh, of course, it's, it's linked to um, uh, most other SDGs. Uh, and uh, from the perspective of nature-based solutions, there are uh, some links that are particularly uh, uh, important, uh, such as linked to uh, SDG 11, uh, a contribution to sustainable uh, cities and communities. Uh, decent work and economic growth, uh, contribution of nature-based solutions uh, to zero hunger, for instance, through, uh, through urban farming, contribution to health and well-being, as I already mentioned, um, through, uh, both through mental and physical health, climate action, uh, life below water, uh, and no poverty by creating jobs and employment, and, uh, and the, again, improving the food security uh, of, the, uh, of the poor. Now I'm I'm going to show you some examples. I think because they are uh, they are quite uh, uh, quite informative. Uh, three examples in particular from uh, uh, the uh, database uh, we developed in the context of the Nature Patient Project, and then further expanded and are expanding in in collaboration with the British Academy. It's uh, the Urban Nature Atlas, uh, which is at the moment uh, I can say uh, the uh, the largest. Uh, uh, database on uh, on nature-based solutions, uh, pretty much around the world. Initially focused on on Europe, so we have uh, uh, about about um, uh, eleven hundred uh, nature-based solutions, inspiring cases uh, mapped here, described here in detail, trying to understand not just what they are in terms of their physical realities and, and manifestation, but also how they are governed, financed, what are their impacts, how are their impacts monitored. Uh, who are the institutional um, uh, owners of these uh, of these projects? Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we are uh, expanding on on the primarily European content now, uh, with uh, with in partnership with the British Academy, and and having particular int interest in in uh, in NBS that contribute uh, to climate change and biodiversity conservation. So linked to the CBD and the uh, UNFCC uh, agenda. So uh, three examples. One is very close to uh, the heart of uh, us from right from Singapore. Uh, it's a river restoration uh, project uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, that uh, basically uh, transformed uh, previously, uh, basically uh, almost paved over and and linearized river into uh, a rich uh, ecosystem, uh, urban ecosystem. Uh, right in the heart of the city. The second example is from uh, from Poland, um, which is uh, showing a link to uh, to uh, human health uh, using horticulture as uh, as therapy. Uh, this is from uh, Bialystok, a very inspiring uh, case. And the third example is from France, which is an industrial example, and, and uh, it uh, it is linked to uh, uh, a re, uh, rethinking reconfiguration of a wastewater treatment plant uh, by adding biodiversity components both at the landscape level and uh, and below the uh, Ovileo uh, wetland. So based on the analysis of, of these uh, over a thousand examples, uh, so we also uh, mapped uh, what uh, SDGs these uh, uh, 
uh, these MBS contribute to, as you see, uh, mostly to green space, habitats and biodiversity, health and well-being, and the list goes on. So essentially, the point here is, I'm not going to go through the details of the list, but the point is that nature-based solutions uh, uh, have actually been documented to contribute uh, to uh, to several SDGs and possibly more than what, uh, what is, uh, is shown here. And I put the emphasis on documenting because in our database, uh, we put great emphasis on on uh, on making sure that uh, that all of this information is referenced and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and supported by evidence. So um, how uh, how do MBS contribute to uh, green recovery, both in terms of um, in terms of uh, COVID recovery, but also the gr the greater challenge of sustainability uh, type uh, recovery. Uh, so, both through uh, mitigation in the climate sense, uh, reducing um, carbon in uh, infrastructure, uh, reducing uh, energy demand by uh, uh, through passive cooling, uh, such as through green roofs, carbon sequestration, of course. They contribute to adaptation. Uh, there are many examples, in, also from the Asia-Pacific region, like in China, how NBS can uh, uh, reduce urban flooding, for instance, uh, how they help coastal protection. They contribute to nature, obviously con through conserving biodiversity, uh, improving environmental quality in all its uh, dimensions, uh, and uh, uh, creating new uh, connections to the values of nature. And finally, I already mentioned the many connections to human well-being. Um, now, uh, in terms of uh, the economics of uh, of uh, nature based solutions uh, contribution uh, the the good news is that while uh, green infrastructure can uh, and usually does require investment and it can be significant but because of these multiple benefits uh, experienced by different stakeholders uh, you see if you add up these uh, these benefits the cost will be the, still the same once you establish an nbs is the same but uh, but in in total social sense the benefits add up so and there and those total benefits can actually uh, exceed significantly the cost so this is so there is a potentially good investment uh, story here uh, what does it take to uh, uh, to mainstream MBS um, we looked at uh, in a separate report at a number of pathways involving uh, wide spectrum of actors. Uh, emphasis at the local level, they all happen in local contexts, uh, how to maximize their contribution to sustainability objectives, multiple sustainability obje objectives and SDGs, uh, focusing on the inter institutional arrangements um, uh, and uh, having monitoring and assess, uh, assessing their impacts and providing evidence of their impacts. Uh, there are details of all these that I'm not going to Go through my the last thing I want to mention is uh, is related to uh, just uh, two or three slides to go is related to another tool we developed. So it's it's very important to move from the all these conceptual issues issues to planning and and one thing that we uh, we wanted to provide through the project is a is a tool that can uh, actually help uh, not just envision uh, given urban spaces with nature based solutions, but also um, uh, also indicating uh, their their impacts. So in this chain of thought, first you can you have an urban context. You first identify the sustainability challenges. Uh, then you can associate sustainability goals and targets related to those challenges. You apply nature-based solutions, and then you get a snapshot view uh, of the impacts. So the urban nature explorer is a, is a tool that uh, that uh, that we developed that can uh, help do this. Again, offering a wide menu of uh, NBS apply to a given location and immediately you see the cost and the impacts uh, and progression, uh, hopefully towards goals. That was it, Gina. I hope I didn't glide too much over time. Uh, these are some links to the tools and the project I mentioned. And again, uh, we were supported by uh, the Horizon program and, and now working with the British Academy and looking forward to continuing this work with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasto, for this very insightful and inspiring presentation. I just have one question that kind of is um, 
um, popping in my mind because what you presented and the way uh, nature-based solutions are now trending, let's say in the environmental sphere, but also in the context of uh, environmental challenges and climate change, it feels like this is magic solution because we can use nature uh, and then we can, uh, if we use it smart and if we can use it in the dedicated way, this is something that can actually make a significant impact and have immediate effects on um, supporting or releasing pressure from the planet or an, an attacking the core of the problem on the ground. What would you like to mention that um, sh we should be mindful of? Because um, I'm pretty sure there, there are best practices that shown that it's not always the best solution if all stakeholders, for example, are not involved and so on and so forth. If you can give us advice, if from tomorrow we will all want to explore and make it work, what it would be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, of course, uh, uh, there are probably not too many uh, magic bullets. At least I don't know. Uh, I don't know any. Uh, and we've been quite careful uh, in our work to try and present. I mean, despite the enthusiasm uh, that uh, that I hope co is coming through. Uh, uh, a balanced picture. Um, now, what that requires is that we talk about, first of all, in, in our language, we talk about impacts of nature-based solutions. And if ca impacts can, of course, be, uh, we hope and we think and we know they tend to be mostly positive. There are also pot uh, potential uh, negative impacts. And the uh, and uh, one example that uh, that uh, that. Uh, that I would mention is uh, that, let's say, uh, a wet, uh, an urban wet, wetland restoration might not just uh, bring back uh, turtles and uh, and ducks. They might uh, it might also bring back mosquitoes. So uh, uh, so there can be some uh, uh, some uh, risks that have to be taken into account. So you do need that balanced perspective. The the other answer is that um, that um, that uh, context matters greatly and uh, uh, of course uh, the the solution that fits uh, in the context of a coastal city let's say related to uh, to addressing storm damage and so on yeah, will be different than um, than uh, addressing uh, urban flooding uh, so the problem the nature of the problem is different the stakeholders are different the, the level of financing is different so and and it means that it, uh, that these processes need uh, 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 need the participation of the of the um, of the professionals, the political level, the stakeholders, um, to uh, to try and 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 uh, and rethink urban space uh, with nature-based solutions uh, as a um, uh, as an answer and 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 their potential. Maybe I can mention one last thing is that we we be working with the uh, with the finance community and uh, they say that they are quite interested in in uh, in uh, ways to, in which they can support uh, green infrastructure and nature based solutions uh, at a much higher level, but uh, but they require uh, stronger evidence uh, data and evidence that they uh, that the uh, that the balance that the balance of impacts is really as positive as uh, as very often uh, claimed in uh, in the literature. So there, I would say, there's a lot more work to be done on on that strengthening the evidence base and linking it to uh, policy uh, and uh, and investment uh, decisions. Thank you so much for uh, for warning us as well. In general, I think. There is a reason for so-called tailored solution approach and this uh, having in mind that you cannot copy paste existing practices without contextualizing it. Um, we have one question that um, I think we might come back to it because it's quite general to all the panelists by the end of this session. If you are able to stay with us a little bit longer, Laszlo, that would be wonderful. Okay, thank sure. you. I have a confirmation. I acknowledge the question in general about the work on desertification. Just we will address it maybe by the end of the session with all the panelists. Uh, so thank you so much for this. I would like to now 
uh, move to the next panelist, uh, Maria Elena Huambachano. She's professor of environmental humanities and indigenous studies at Syracuse University, native Peruvian indigenous scholar, emigrated to New Zealand at young age, uh, collaborated and was inspired by cross-cultural approach to her work in indigenous food sovereignty, environmental justice, uh, indigenous philosophies of well-being and research. Uh, Maria Elena is an active member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And she has been a lead author of the 16 high-level panel of experts on food security and nutrition. And I just would like to introduce her also with this in mind that we are now actually looking what can we do on the ground? How can we make sure that the communities uh, are taken care of? Um, so, uh, dear Maria Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Ayiancho, Mantacani, Peru, Sutimi Maria Elena, Tenakoto Kato, greetings everyone. Um, it is, I'm excited to be here and thank you for the opportunity to talk about indigenous ecological philosophies and their contributions to addressing sustainable development goals, not only specifically on goal number 15, but in the broader interrelated um, goals. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about specifically on the role of indigenous well-being, understanding of well-being linked to food systems. Over the past, um, over a decade, I've been connecting with many indigenous communities from every, you know, for many multiple um, countries, food growers, um, activists, people engaged in food justice, and all these conversations in North America, South America, um, Europe, Latin America, the, con the connection between land, food, and health was very prominent. And also it brought to light struggles and issues that indigenous communities and local peoples and people who heavily depend on the land are facing. For instance, soil degradation, biodiversity loss, um, our lack of autonomy to how we grow food, when, and by whom the food is to be produced that resonated with the concept of food sovereignty. The broader definition of food sovereignty is coined by La Via Campesina in 1996, redefined in 2007 in the Declaration Naline. It focuses on the rights of peoples to healthy and culturally relevant food and to define our own foods. Therefore, it just doesn't focus on a calorie count diet, but more on a healthy diet that is connected to cultural foods. While the, um, the concept of food sovereignty resonates with indigenous aspirations, here I want to point out that indigenous food sovereignty moves away, takes an extra step to highlight our kinship relationships. That means honoring our responsibility that we have with our non-human relatives the rivers, the mountains, the lakes, all these relatives that deserve to be respected. However, they have not been respected. As we are seeing rivers being polluted and there are so many issues happening. So indigenous food sovereignty highlights our kinship relationships and also our cultural responsibilities to nurture and respect those um, relations. Unfortunately, our, our indigenous ways of life, our understanding about the human nature, um, the relationship and food traditions, food ways, it has been disrupted by colonization. And one of the drivers of colonization, it's industrial food production. Here we can see on the right hand side, a vibrant food garden landscape. We have biodiversity, you have what's seen here, the corn, where we're able in those spaces and landscapes, we're able to practice our traditions, our food traditions, 
creativity, technology, indigenous agricultural practices that speaks of a broader understanding, a more holistic understanding of health and well-being on the planet. On the right hand side, this is what we have been accustomed to, processed foods, which we all know is causing harm, not only to the environment, but to humanity, especially indigenous peoples who are facing a large number of type two diabetes, uh, obesity problems. And when it comes to how indigenous peoples are coping with COVID-19, here's an example of, I think most of us have faced this, um, this scenario, being able to, not being able to find food even in supermarkets. And it highlights how fragile our food systems are. It highlights the need to reposition our thinking and to be able to focus more on the creativity and the knowledge-based solutions of indigenous peoples. And how we are responding to it, we're holding tight to our traditions, our innovation systems, our creativity, our ways of knowing and being that leads to a philosophical strength. And this is drawing from my study with Maori of Ottawa, New Zealand and Quechua of Peru. If the land is healthy, our foods and ourselves will be healthy. This is a philosophical strength, which it makes sense, but in reality it's not, it's not happening. So what I did, I wanted to dig in more. I wanted to understand the constitution of indigenous thinking, their practices, most of the studies have been done within an indigenous group and a non-indigenous. In my study, I draw from two indigenous knowledge systems, Quechua of Atarua, Quechua of Peru and Maori of Atarua, New Zealand. And I focus on their philosophies of well-being or living well that speak of more of a philosophy. It provides social, political, cultural institutions and frameworks guiding potential solutions to save the environment. So I travel to, um, in the North Island of Aotearoa and in Peru, I focus in the region of Cusco in the highlands of Peru and I focus, I work with Quechua communities and in Aotearoa with Maori tribes in the North Island of the country. There is so much to talk about this in my findings, and I'm trying to be brief here. Um, but I will just to give you a summary of the main findings of this study. Underpinning indigenous good living philosophies of Maori and Quechua are unique values, belief systems, ethics that provide a rich framework, a holistic framework on how we grow food, on our political institutions, how we um, enact sovereignty over our land, autonomy, self-governance. There, there are a set of values um, and belief systems. I mentioned here only a few, and I'll give you an example how we are drawing from our own traditions, our own knowledge systems to react to stress. Uh, for instance, in this case, how we react to the COVID-19. And an example is that as soon as Atarua went into a nationwide lockdown, Maori tribes, when I call relatives uh, in Atarua and I talk to Maori, they told me and they share with me this picture. This is from uh, Tina Nata of the tribe of Natipuro. She shared with me these pictures that they came together, they mobilized, collectivized to ensure that Maori tribes that are in rural areas and do not have uh, access to health structure and they're more vulnerable to new diseases such as COVID, they were protected. So they decided to establish these checkpoints and enact the rights of self-determination. In the case of my Quechua relatives, they continue to thrive together. They continue to come together as a collective and been able to draw from the self government ancestral self governance system named IU in Quechua, where they take turns on making sure that which families grow in specific food to ensure there is no food wasted and ensure that biodiversity is thriving as well as communities. 
ethics of care, solidarity, responsibility ingrained in these ways of knowing and being has been highlighted. It continues to, but it was even more so during the pandemic. Food gardens, communities that were growing food, they came together not only to provide food for communities, but for the larger uh, urban areas, delivering food care packages and highlighting the value of ethics of solidarity, responsibility to one another, to the land, and to continue preserving and um, stewarding this relationship. Economies of well-being, moving away from the economic growth thinking, moving away from econ economies of competition to focus more on solidarity, on love, on trading in a just way to be able to barter, um, to re regain more of the bartering system, to be able to exchange goods. Most of the times when we talk about funding solutions, um, we tend to disregard the valuable knowledge of indigenous science, native science or uh, traditional ecological knowledge. An example of indigenous technology and knowledge it's the development of indigenous agricultural calendars. For instance, in Atarua, the Mara Mataka, the moon calendar. In Peru, the sun and moon calendar, the Inti in Kia. The, most of us know also the Mayan calendar. And in North America, the Menominee people with the 13 moons calendar. This technology and innovation system have provided indigenous peoples with an understanding of what is the best way to grow food, being more attuned to our senses, being more attuned to the rhythms of nature, the changes, environmental indicators, being able to be more attuned to what's happening. When we talk about food and food waste, how I describe it, it's that food is not just sustenance for indigenous peoples, local communities, and people who heavily rely on the land for their food sustenance and well being. Food encompasses culture, dignity, identity, history for indigenous peoples, cultural memories that tie to our food ways, our traditions. This is how I would describe the aspirations of indigenous peoples based on my work with Sketch and Maori and how we're working towards rematriating holistic collective well-being. This is a term that emerged from my study as an expression of indigenous aspirations to restore our broken food system, to restore the disrupted lands, to restore um, the whole system be able to return to our and, and, and uphold our indigenous traditions, recognize traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous agroecology, economies of well being. And we're doing that. We are um, now we see more of an indigenous movement and indigenous food sovereignty reclaiming that. We see here an example the mobile farmers market in Madison, Wisconsin, where they are being able to make their foods more accessible, traditional foods, food gardens, use are more involved. We continue to thrive uh, with our techniques to preserve our precious seeds. Here, an example of how we continue to reclaim and rematriate our knowledge system through seeds. Seeds are life and they speak of our cultural memories and our heritage to preserve the land. Here's an example of um, a seed rematriation project by the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, heralded by Mohawk um, Robin White, to be able to reclaim those lost relatives and to provide them with love, care, and in the nurture that they deserve. An example is the project I'm leading with the Quechua um, communities um, in Peru, seed savings, uh, and developing environmental indicators of well being because food is a marker of health and well-being for indigenous peoples. So we know that in this case, when our relative, in this case, the chulpe, the seed, used to grow like this much and it's not growing, 
that much anymore because of climate change, because of other issues. We know that Mother Earth Pachamama is not well, it's unhealthy. So it's not well. So therefore, if the land is not healthy, the environment is not healthy, our food and what we eat will not be good for us. This is an example, and here I want to just celebrate the amazing work that many indigenous communities and local communities around the world are doing to restore justice to our broken food systems. Climate change and solutions to our broken food systems lie within indigenous knowledge and traditions. And we need to provide more of a broader platform to hear the voices because we provide more of a holistic understanding of preserved environment. We continue to seed our own futures. And just to finish, this is the book I'm finishing on recovering our ancestral food ways, indigenous traditions as a recipe for living well. Um, I have a lot more to talk about, but for now I will say Sulpaiki, Kira, and thank you. Thank you so much, Marielena, for this presentation. I think what you have managed to actually convey in such short time really touches upon multiple issues. One of them is, in general, our relationship with nature, because we are also part of the ecosystem that we are kind of destroying at the moment. And then you have mentioned very strongly the values like that are crucial and important, but also that we already have the expertise and we already have the knowledge. It is in indigenous communities. I mean, it is also like everywhere else, but you just brought this perspective of indigenous communities. I am quite familiar with some of the activities that are happening globally, but specifically in India regarding looking at and trying to measure actually that coming back to the traditional agricultural practices and treating what our natural resources with respect actually increases the productivity of the systems and results in more nutritious food. And then you also mentioned the things that um, that kind of resonated with me, like we are what we eat. Yesterday, we had very strong presentation about plastic that human humans already are like partly digesting plastic because of the pollutions that is everywhere. So this this was really insightful. And um, I just wanted uh, wanted to ask you like. How do you think we could better convey this contribution to the knowledge from indigenous people um, and manage to put the message across stronger in order to address the issues of food security? Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a very important question. And I would say the first thing to do is to invite them to the discussion table, to hear their solutions, to hear their struggles. We know the struggles already, but let's focus more on the solutions. And it is very important to recognize the available ancestral knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge. As I mentioned before, we talk about science, we talk about high tech science, but we are disregarding the body of knowledge of indigenous and local communities. An example that I gave, it's the indigenous agricultural calendars which have been substituted by no calendars because we are not growing according to the seasons anymore. We continue to violate the dignity of Mother Earth by growing 24-7 all throughout the year. So the solutions are within indigenous communities and people who rely on the land. They need to be invited to discussions. They continue to work quietly and in niches. And, then, and now we need to bring more and more to, to highlight into the table all those solutions happening around the world, as you mentioned, in Africa and in Europe and South Asia. We're seeing this revival um, of indigenous traditional food ways and local communities are also holding ties to those um, food traditions, activities. We're seeing more of Native American chefs. Um, um, been able to reconnect more with their um, ingredients and cook. 
the same in, in Peru, we have this, um, this more and more shares, we have a vibrant biodiversity. So we're seeing the role of uh, indigenous chefs and moving the uh, health and well-being agenda. We're seeing the role of women, especially when it comes to seeds and seed rematriation. We're seeing the role of youth uh, being more, more involved in, in garden projects. So that's the change is happening. As I said, they continue to work, but I think it's good to bring those voices to the table and uphold the rights to be able to lead healthy futures. Thank you so much for bringing this knowledge. Um, I quickly Google because I wanted to get it right. Um, this is something that always comes to mind for me when um, when we look at the SDG 15 and its targets and life on land, food production and food security are not exactly located here, but somehow I think because it is so strongly intertwined with our lives, and we have this concept that we are only nine meals from anarchy. So this is something that when we, he when we think about it, there is very few things that can immediately trigger discomfort and, um, and need to be addressed as a priority. And when we have such a tools as an indigenous knowledge and we already have the solutions, we just somehow, uh, chose to move forward and disregard what have been uh, what have been there all along and uh, then we get into trouble so thank you so much for bringing it up and if you can stay with us till the end for like the final closing session that would be wonderful and um, so thank you and i would like to now invite gertrude kabusimi kenyangi she is executive director of support for women in agriculture and environment in Uganda. So we are still staying um, in similar topics. She has been democratically elected by civil society organizations across the African continent to the position of observer on the Climate Investment Fund of the Forest Investment Program. She has been a facilitator for Africa Region CSO at UNEP and a member of Sustainable Consumption and Production Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Committee of UNEP and UNESCO. Uh, she has won several prizes for the forestry awarded by Forestry Partnership at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, dear Gertrude, the floor is yours, and I would like to invite you to the presentation on Africa's forest ecosystems and COVID-19 presentation on how do we build back and forward better, which has been also mentioned um, at the previous days of our forum. Dear Gertrude, the floor is yours. I just wanted to check, do we have Gertrude with us? Gertrude on yes. the screen. She seemed, yeah, I can it see might... her and then I can see muted. So I'm not quite sure what would be the best way. Maybe there is just temporary glitch. I think in the meantime, actually, why we are waiting, unless because Dear Gertrude, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. So I think it would be good if you and OSD shares the slides. Is that correct? Yes. yes. I was expecting okay. you to share the slides mm. for me. So if we can yeah. have a help from the UNOSD colleagues, that would be wonderful. Excellent, it's coming and um, I will switch on my video at 10 minutes mark. So this is just that you know that 10 minutes has passed and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. I hope you can see my slides. Hello? Hello? We can hear you Hello. and we can see you. And then you can, uh, if you have a layout on your WebEx window, you can choose stack or full screen view. Maybe this will help you to see the slides. I see, I'm seeing the slides. 
But I was wondering mm -hmm. whether you are the ones who are sharing them or me, or I'm the one who's sharing. Uh, it, it is being shared by you and office. So you just will need to say ah, next okay. slide when you want to progress. Okay, then. Okay, my presentation is entitled Africa's Forest Ecosystems and COVID-19. How do we build back and forward better? Africa forests are terrestrial ecosystems. In other words, they are a geographical area where biotic and abiotic things work together to form a bubble of life. Can I have a second slide, please? Okay. They cover 20.6% of the continent's land area and represent 15.5% of the world's forest cover, providing nationally, regionally, and globally important ecosystem services indispensable for achieving the objectives of Africa Agenda 2063 and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Their habitats for many are living things, both fauna and flora. They work together to form a bubble of life on land. Next slide, please. The good and the bad effects of COVID on the forest sector. COVID has had the negative effect, as I'm going to outline. Already the pandemic has led to the postponement and in some cases, outright cancellation of many of our sustainable forest management activities, such as the regional policy dialogues on illegal forest exploitation, the 15th session of UNFF was canceled, the 23rd session of Food and Agriculture Organization Committee on Forestry, which was slated for June 2020 was also canceled. But although these are major setbacks for the global momentum, promote sustainable management of forests and trees, Reuters, the news agency, reported the case of Otamba Kilimi National Park, where the rate of illegal timber harvesting plummeted to zero during COVID because of a drop in international demand for logs. That was a positive. Next slide, please. At national level and regional level, the impacts are already palpable. The negative impacts are already palpable. Critical funding for basic forest management activities have been sacrificed by government and development partners and shifted to mitigating the effects of COVID-19. National forest institutions may run out of funds for their forest management activities. The recruitment of additional manpower for the sector will no longer be a priority for many countries. Local forestry staff may no more have the means to patrol the forests, thus leaving the latter to the mercy of forest fires and other destructive elements. Next slide. With COVID-19 cases in decline in China, there's expected to be a gradual surge of demand for precious logs from Africa to feed the wood industry in China. What is more challenging is the likelihood that forests in Africa will be seen as cheap and avoidable means of recovery from the economic downturns created by COVID-19. Governments may resort to licensing huge commercial timber interests to raise the desperate, desperately needed financial resources to support socioeconomic development after the pandemic. Next slide. Job loss in the sector has affected the local communities surrounding forest plantations. All these are the negatives caused by COVID who worked as patrol people, nursery bed workers, pruners, cleaners. Consequently, local communities have been and will continue to be tempted to extract as much as possible from the forest as part of supplementing their income. 
the incidences of illicit charcoal burning, as you can see in the picture, and other unauthorized forest exploitation practices have increased. Many households in Africa affected by COVID-19 have turned to forests to provide them with extra food sources and traditional medicines. Many social media platforms are already inundated with concoctions comprising forest products as possible remedies and cures for COVID-19. This might sound good as it underlines the importance of forests. But it has a flip side, and that is the risk of, a, of, of a forest and trees supply these cures. Next slide, please. Next slide. So, how do we build back better? But my my title was build bet, back better, uh, back and forward better. So the, the recommendations include increased investment in the forest sector speed up recovery it is required new and addition of financial resources from all sources for the implementation of sustainable forest management and strengthen scientific and technical cooperation and partnerships must be enhanced the second recommendation it will also require an enhanced level of cooperation coordination, coherence, and synergies on forest-related issues at all levels, including within the World Bank, the United Nations system, the African Development Bank, and across member organizations, across member organizations of the collaborative partnership on forests, as well as across sectors and other relevant stakeholders. Partnerships. The, the, the other recommendation, this is perhaps the most pressing time to actively involve the local communities more in forest management through devolution and decentralization. Community forestry and other community-based natural resources A limit. Another recommendation is legal trade in timber. Legal trade in timber and other forest products must be part of agreements of the various partnerships between Africa and other regions and countries of the world. This is necessary to address the illegal exploitation of Africa's natural resources, including forests, wildlife, and fisheries. Next slide. Region and transboundary boundary collaboration are key in supporting national responses mechanisms to deal with the trade in forest products. This underlines the significance of the forest convergence plans of the economic community of West Africa and other regional cooperation bodies. They all together provide strategic direction and complement what exists at national level, especially in the area of capacity development, partnership building, and resource mobilization. It's, it becomes imperative to continue working with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the United Nations Forest Forum as the global institutions with mandates of promoting sustainable forest management across the world. Next slide, please. Yeah. Existing, okay, police and military checkpoints should be empowered to monitor and stop illegal trade, illegal timber movements. Where possible, forestry personnel should be allowed to operate during public emergencies such as lockdowns to avoid undue exploitation of forests. Next slide. So we need existing global and regional mechanisms for supporting the environment sector. They need to be strengthened and made more accessible 
by African governments to support sustainable forest management. It's also imperative that development partners and donors ring fence already earmarked funds for the forest sector and desist from, uh, from re-assigning it towards COVID responses. The national budgetary allocation to the sector must be maintained. Next slide, please. Well, this is my last slide. Thank you for listening. Please save our habitat. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. This is really very cheerful end of the presentation. Uh, and then it, it somehow made me think about Jane McGurrell and her work also with the local communities on restoring ecosystems. This was really, really good presentation on sustainable forest management practices, among other things. And you have shared a lot of um, advice and also practice examples like from from the work you have done which is very impressive and um, can you let us know what measures are in the country such as Uganda that you put in place to mitigate future outbreaks of pandemics in the context also of your very insightful presentation yeah pandemics happen suddenly they are not planned for so it becomes very difficult to put in place to put in there like a disaster it becomes very difficult to put in place response measures or mitigation measures but as a country there's a lot of awareness creation around hygiene around uh, separating because what happened to us COVID-19 was a zoonotic disease and our people are very well known to depend on nature even for food even in forests hunting illegal hunting so now people are being sensitized that diseases can cross from animals to human beings and they become very disastrous it's a lot more, it revolves a lot around sensitization. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I just would like, because we will be closing now, so I just would like to get together all the speakers that are still with us online. I got the hint from Ingeborg that she unfortunately has to leave us because I just would like to close this session with the question that has been from our audience, that is, how do we like how do we address the challenge of life on land and if you can let us know what would be the one thing from your perspective that we should focus on in order to advance the 2030 agenda specifically on sdg 15 because as usual if we would try to focus on everything it will be very difficult but if we can have from all of you the closing conclusion on Based on your expertise, what is that you would like to advise everybody to focus on? That would be something that we can use. So if I can just invite everybody to join us um, in the final session and switch on the camera, that would be wonderful. I can see we have, uh, we have also Laszlo with us and Maria Elena. So, um, Maybe we could start with Laszlo because he has been the first one presenting in this uh, in this train of presentation. What what would be your um, advice? Because protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystem, manage forests sustainably, combat desertification, halt and reverse land degradation, and halt biodiversity loss is a huge objective to tackle. So using the smart approach, where would you start? The way you are posing a question that is impossible to answer simply. But if I can say one thing, I think it's it's related to uh, uh, to um, to having a mindset where the value of 
uh, of nature and natural ecosystems, terrestrial ecosystems, uh, is in its place, both in terms of what they provide um, yeah, in material terms, but also what they provide in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, intangible benefits for mental health in terms of uh, their contribution in, uh, in recognition and spiritual uh, practices. So it's, uh, it's having changing a mindset from, uh, from purely a technocratic perspective that, you know, life on land and ecosystems, it's, you know, it's somewhere out there, it's far and, uh, and, uh, and our relationship to it is, 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 is somewhat fuzzy. It's not fuzzy. I mean, this, this, this is essential. Uh, they have, natural ecosystems have been part and parcel of, uh, of human evolution in very fundamental ways, as, as, as it was pointed out so well by Maria Elena. Uh, in many cases, that still is the case. I think having, have changing the mindset to recognize all this, to me, that's perhaps the most important. Thank you so much. So now I would pass the floor to Maria Elena. What would you say in the response to that? Thank you for the question. And, and I just want to build up on what Laszlo mentioned about um, we definitely need to have a more holistic and inclusive approach to how we relate to nature, restore um, our human nature relationship. It also requires a stressing in dialogues between all communities, all people, because we are all citizens on this planet. And strengthening dialogues and relationships will build up partnerships from local to global, trying to find ways to, trying to find solutions together. Most of the solutions are at the local level. I work with quite a few community uh, groups. So community-based research projects are very important, and that will help us to thrive a coalition building um, framework so we can be able to work as a collective uh, and ensure that all worldviews, Western worldviews and indigenous worldviews and other worldviews are integrated when it comes to framing a more sustainable solution to preserve our beautiful planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll get through that. What would you say to that? It, um, uh, speaking from the perspective of African uh, populations, for African populations, it's very difficult to separate them. They, all our solutions are nature-based. Now nature-based has become a, a, a buzzword. It's in the corridors of UN, in the corridors of wherever there is any discussion. But for us, we have always been using nature-based solutions to meet our needs. So it's difficult to separate them from nature. As such, it's good to integrate all these at, at global level. It's good to integrate all the uh, discussions, all the discourses. I mean, there's CBD, there's uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, there's Paris Agreement, the United Nations Environment Assembly. There are lots of conventions. So what we are saying, that all these should be speaking to each other because they all have a common goal. So that when our countries are making policies, they are informed in such a way that it's coherent. There's policy coherence. But at practice level, it's good to keep people informed, to, to keep a, a bit, uh, to pe keep responses to climate change in their scientific and social context, bearing in mind that you won't separate people. You will not like protect the environment. You will only conserve it. There's a difference between protection where the populations are not allowed to touch it and conservation where they are used to use it, they're allowed to use it sustainably so that people, a government and all those in authority will watch what's happening between the people and the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Gertrude, Maria Elena, and Laszlo. That was wonderful closing, I think, of this panel. I do know that I didn't make your life easier. We also have one more uh, question from the chat, which is ecosystems and biodiversity are key to protection and expansion of the space. How can we do more? What specifically do we need to do in our everyday lives? 
And I think it has been partly addressed by all of you by saying about changing the mindset, value nature, having more dialogue and collaboration and listen to each other in order to actually have a better understanding because in the end of the day, we all want to achieve, um, achieve the goal of having life on land and still uh, being able to coexist with nature and address the challenges we are facing at the moment. I would like to thank you all for your, uh, for your time and, um, and dedication to this forum and also sharing all the resources. Um, Darren is sharing the Padlet page when we put some of the things uh, that have been discussed today, nature-based solution database, GO6 report, uh, future of food, a couple of solutions, which I think also contributes to this knowledge exchange. If you ha you will share with us also other resources, um, there will be UNOSD page that I think is also shared in the chat, but further on it would be in the email about the um, about all the with the all presentation, all the materials and all the additional materials that have been uh, discussed at this forum. And then I would like to thank you all and pass the floor to Jean Dragon to officially conclude this four day event. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, we, I, I will start to close this. Day. I mean, this session uh, is went very fast again, and then it was very, uh, um, this session looking at SDG 15 life on land, particularly looking at how COVID-19 recovery in the 2030 agenda cannot be fully achieved without addressing SDGs. We had very, very good presentations uh, today and discussions. And now I'm, I took notes and I want I meant to bring this, but I think that uh, um, Darren and, uh, and um, Gina, you, you did well. And, bringing these uh, uh, issues. And then I think I have to skip the, 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 the different parts. And then I would just like now to uh, to uh, go to um, to thank all the speakers for this session, because we still, sorry, we, we still have to also to, to close the whole, the whole meeting. So I, I would like to now to to thank all the speakers for this session. And uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Pierre Boileau, Head of Global Environment Outlook, UN Environment. This is Ingeborg Nistoy, Director of Public Strategy for Sustainable Development. Mr. Raphael Weyland, Head of the Brussels Office Nature and Biodiversity Conservation Union. You, uh, Gina, Ms. Rosina Ulaska, Acting Director, uh, Sustainable Development and Public Health Development Asia Re Euro Foundation with Ms. Rico Kimoto, manager of the International Public Health Sustainable Development and Public Health Department at Asia Foundation as well. Uh, thank also to Mr. Laszlo Pinta, head of the Department of Environmental Science and Policy, Central European University. Ms. Maria Elena Wambat. Channel, Professor of the Huma Environmental Humanities and Indigenous Studies, Syracuse University. Ms. Gertrude Kabusimbi Kenyangi, Executive Director, Support for Women in Agriculture and Environment in Uganda. I see, I mean, you all know that I think we could have gone for longer, and I'm sure everyone had more and more to bring, but uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, generosity of sharing your insight, experience, and solutions to achieve SDG 15 on life on land, COVID-19 recovery, and the 2030 agenda. Now, if you want, if you allow me, I will quickly change my hat. And as a moderator of the closing session, I would like to invite His Excellency Ambassador Leon Feder. Deputy Di Executive Director of the Asia Euro Foundation, our partner in the Sustainable Development Forum, to deliver his closing remarks. 
So, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Darago, and, and uh, first of all, thank you all the panelists today and and the, for all the contributions. Um, uh, for I mean, it's for, for me that I did not have the opportunity to listen into all the days. Uh, but today was really a comprehensive brief for me on SDG 15 and the very rich uh, interrelationship uh, between the, the different areas. So let me first of all, again, also thank uh, all of you, uh, of course, the UN, uh, uh, UN team, but also uh, my own team for, for having organized this. Uh, and we are very proud and honored to be uh, a partner of uh, of the the uh, transfer, uh, sustainable development transfer, transformation forum over the years, so I think this is a very uh, useful and a very rich uh, experience. So over the last few days, you have of course looked into uh, the different uh, SDGs, uh, uh, goal four on ac equitable quality of education and uh, promoting lifelong learning opportunities, an area where. Uh, ASEF is particularly active. Uh, we we bring Asians and Europeans together in in the higher education uh, directors conference, but also uh, in different other areas. You have spoken then on the uh, act, uh, the achieve uh, the uh, SDG five on achieving uh, gender equality and empowering uh, w all women and girls. You have another topic where. Uh, IGAP uh, is and wants to be uh, active because this is, of course, uh, a, a very important um, part of the overall 2030 agenda. Um, so then you had uh, yesterday uh, life below water uh, and obviously ocean seas and the marine resources are under the constant threat from pollution, warming uh, and our, our acidification that are disrupting marine ecosystems and the communities they support. Um, so uh, not to speak of the plastic uh, that is uh, uh, everywhere and even in the deepest uh, uh, parts of, of the planet. Now today, of course, uh, I must say that I have been really impressed by all the presentations. I, I have learned so, so much. I mean, it's obvious that and we know that that all the SDGs are uh, interrelated, but um, I think it's also within even within one SDG we have so many uh, issues and areas that we have to to look at, from uh, the biodiversification, uh, the uh, meat production, and also the uh, the waste of food. I was not aware actually that it was uh, that much. That thirty percent is actually quite. Uh, quite a lot. I mean, on on uh, the uh, maybe on the food production and the uh, pr provenance of um, of uh, food where it comes from, and that especially uh, meat production is very um, detrimental to to the planet. That has been known maybe for for longer. I again also I thank the uh, the, the the colleagues from uh, who have spoken on the EU Green Deal. And obvious, and also the, the difficulty that we have to to to, uh, to gap the the cap, the common agricultural policy, and and the different strategies that are now there, and the issue also, of course, on the um, implementation of these strategies, but also the um, how we uh, how we uh, attribute the resources. So I think these are all very interesting and important aspects. Uh, again, I'd like to thank also my colleagues on having spoken on the regenerative agriculture and agroecology on the subsidies and so on. So, um, uh, and then, of course, also uh, the, the other topic that was very instructive for me is on the, the nature, uh, uh, the NBS nature build and back, building back better and building forward better. Uh, so, uh, very interesting also this. Uh, the urban nature atlas, I find that is a very, and even though, of course, we cannot uh, just copy paste everything, but I think uh, things are often, uh, if they are done in one part of the world, maybe they can be uh, duplicated and, and adapted in another part. 
uh, I would uh, find it also on the uh, indigenous um, well-being and the food sovereignty, I think it is an extremely important uh, part. And I think it is also indeed the, uh, the, uh, the way how we look at food and uh, that, uh, I mean, it's always right to, to come back to the disruptions that have been done by colonization, but also uh, by the industrialization that, that, of course, go hand in hand. The fact on the processed food, how it actually uh, alienates us uh, from uh, from uh, good and healthy food. So I think is, these are all very important parts. And then last, but certainly also not least, how we treat the forests and how... Uh, so I, I in the last uh, two presentations, I really like the the spirit of uh, how we look at holistically at nature and how we can actually uh, relate uh, ourselves better uh, to uh, to uh, nature. So in that regard, obviously, uh, I find that the um, even though it's it's it, it's very easy to say that and and it's so obvious, but at the same time, it is so complicated when we say, well, it's all a matter of a mindset. Yes, it is, but but it is also very difficult sometimes to change our mindset. But I think this is what what we are what we are here for. And and again, I, the the more holistic approach to to all of this, I think, is is the basic of uh, all of this. So I don't want to um, speak much longer. Uh, that I just wanted to express that I'm really grateful to have been here uh, with you all today and uh, to acknowledge indeed that uh, this is extremely important work and we are very uh, honored to be part of that. So thank you very much and all the best also for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your thoughtful closing remarks. Uh, please allow me now to take a few minutes uh, to, uh, to deliver the closing remarks uh, for UNOSD. I'll be, I'll be short. So, Ambassador Faber, distinguished panelists, colleagues and participants, ladies and gentlemen, today we've come to an end of our remarkable journey, to get, journey together in the Sustainable Development Transformation Forum that was at the seventh edition. Despite the restraints and hazard of the COVID-19 pandemic, and despite other major threats that are happening in the world, we have managed to produce a very successful forum. Through the excellent presentation and panel discussion during the whole, the whole week, the forum succeeded to bring to light ideas and experiences regarding challenges, responses, and solutions for the implementation of SDGs 4 on quality education, 5 on gender equality, 14 on life below uh, water, 15 on life of, on land we did today and, and integrating SDG 17 on partnership for the goals in all the, the session. In the context of the COVID-19 crisis recovery and the more than ever urgent need to achieve the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. I don't want to make too much, to take too much time in trying to summarize all the sessions. I would simply like to reiterate some strong message that I believe came out through all the sessions and today's session makes no exception to this. So the profound transformations that are needed to achieve sustainable development come, of course, from collective action. However, it starts at individual level from within and not from outside, wherever you are and like a drop or a pebble in the ocean, which seems insignificant at first sight, it can, when added together with other drops and pebbles, create big waves of transformation. And no need to say that we need such a big wave, not to say a tsunami of transformation, if I may, if we want to deliver the 2030 agenda in the years left. Of course, we could not in so, so short period of time, examine deeply all the themes of the forum this year. For that reason, we need to continue our conversation. This will occur to the next edition of the Sustainable Transformation, Sustainable Development Transformation Forum, which we will like to convene in person in Incheon City 
when the situation allows. As well, besides the SZTF report, which we will be somehow like the proceeding of the meeting, we're also working on a publication where some articles on the Teams Explore this week will be developed. We produced such a publication over the last couple of years, and I invite you to look at the SDTF publications on the, system, on the UN OSD website. The next one, which will draw inspiration from the team of this SDTF, should be online on our website again in the next couple of months. Before closing, I would like to thank again all the presenters and panelists who generously gave their time and shared ideas, knowledge, and experience on the Team Explore over the four days of the forum. I would like to also to thank Mr. Darren Swanson, our consultant, who acted as the main moderator of the forum. I would also would like to thank Ms. Regina Pulowski. Acting Director of the Sustainable Development and Public Health Department as the Asia Euro Foundation for also her excellent work at moderating some of the sessions. The forum would not be would not have been possible without the dedicated support and selfless, selfless dedications of the staff of the UNOSD and our interns who helped us master the technology keep in touch with the presenters and participants and supplied us with a constant stream of information and support. On behalf of the United Nations Office for Sustainable Development, I would also like to thank our longtime partner in the Sustainable Development Transformation Forum, the Asia Europe Foundation. Finally, I would like to thank you, the participants who followed us over the last four days. I look forward to meeting you again hopefully in person for the next forum, which we hope yet to be in person soon when the situation gets better. Meanwhile, feel, please stay safe and healthy. Keep courage and hope we'll get out of this altogether very soon. Thank you. Please note that all the material, including the PDF version and the speech, video recording session and other reference material will be, that will be coming keep coming will be uploaded on the and available on the Sustainable Development Transformation Forum webpage. The e-link was provided earlier in the chat box and you can always find anyway the, the these in the uh, UNOSD website www.unosd.un.org. Before I say goodbye, I need also to tell you to please uh, complete the evaluation uh, the, the evaluation form within 30 minutes. Now it has appeared on the on the screen. We we'll leave it there for the next 30 minutes or so. So you, in case you need to take the uh, the link or to uh, to uh, I mean it's quite easy. Slido dot com like backslash uh, backslash sorry the the, the, the this number ba uh, hashtag SDTF 2022. And um, yeah, uh, it's very, it's easy, it's quick, and uh, it will be helpful for us. So thank you very much again. I, I wish you a good day, evening, or night, whatever you are. And I say goodbye and see you soon.